You're online, please start. Hello, everybody. Today we start our online roadshow and uh, I'm introducing you our speakers for today. Uh, today's discussion will be devoted um, to investments and pivots during pandemic. Uh, with uh, including such topics as uh, virtual reality gaming and artificial intelligence. And our speakers for today uh, include uh, my co-moderator for today, Adrian Nicolescu, Regional Director, UK and Romania, Pasta Capital, Tess Hall, VC founder, chairwoman of Tess Ventures, Vika's dad, partner, um, Sarah Cap Ventures, Andy Lian, Intergovernmental Blockchain Advisor and Chairman for Asia of Decent Foundation, um, and uh, Rahul Gupta, consultant, and uh, Tony Tong, co-founder of Super Angels Ventures. And I'll start with the first round of introductions with um, Andy Lian. Could you please briefly introduce yourself before we start our panel discussion? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, Hi. yes, sure. Yeah. So anyway, my, my name is Andy. So. Um, um, like Nadia has uh, mentioned, you know, I am the chairperson of Descent uh, Foundation based in uh, Switzerland. We look at a lot of uh, different blockchain projects and uh, we are mainnet ourselves. Uh, apart from that, something that is uh, more, um, you know, uh, related to today's topic, I'm also the chairman of uh, Korean uh, Esports Industry Association. Um, and we are actively promoting games. So things like uh, VR, uh, Esports and uh, so forth, uh, some of the things that we uh, are constantly uh, pushing. Um, just a brief introdu introduction here. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Andy. And uh, Branka, would you also join us and introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Priyanka. I head the UK operations for Kila Corporate Transactions, are active in the private equity alternative investment space. And uh, recently I've joined as a director in a FinTech uh, wealth management uh, platform. So that's where I think um, this current discussion will be relevant. And I'll talk about it more as the discussion starts. Uh, and I'm based out of London um, and we have an office in Mayfair. So it'll be good if uh, I can catch up with any of you once, uh, whenever you're in London. Thank you. Thank you, Pranka and Vikas. Hi, uh, my name is Vikas Dutt. I'm one of the founding partners of uh, Saracap Ventures, uh, which is an early stage uh, technology venture fund uh, based out of uh, California and Singapore. Uh, we invest uh, globally uh, across US, uh, across uh, Europe, as well as Asia. Uh, we are currently deploying a $50 million fund. Uh, it's a great uh, time and position to be in where you have cash and a lot of deals coming to you. Uh, so that's what uh, we are focused on as of now. Uh, currently, we have about 11 companies in our uh, portfolio, and we are looking for about nine more, uh, you know, to invest within this year. Uh, thank you. And Raul? Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm Raul Kukla. I'm a consultant to Venture Capital Fund and invest six years of my career into technology-focused VC fund. I have varied experience over 12 years across a wide spectrum of VC consulting, PMS, and other financial services. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Adrian? Um, hello, everybody. Oh, it is not possible. Uh, Tess, could you maybe join in? Hi, yes, I'm Tess. Um, I'm um, in venture capital. I'm the uh, founder of Test Venture, and uh, I am based out of um, Palo Alto, California, and happy to join uh, this panel. I invest in early stage companies, been investing over a decade. Prior to that, um, while I was an undergrad, started um, a startup, and my co-founder and I, uh, you know, by the time we graduated, uh, we had about three acquisition offers. So we decided to sell one of them, uh, sold to one of them. And then uh, I decided to pay it forward by reinvesting back into founders. So uh, I invest in FinTech, um, AI, uh, VR, biotech, because uh, at early stage, it's a founder's bet and it's about the founding team. 
uh, and also uh, decided to spend time at Stanford to get mentored by some of the best um, VCs, uh, entrepreneurs, professors, and really been very fortunate to build out a great network of um, great founders, um, great advisors, everyone now today that can really be able to help you know, make a, um, a VC platform successful and for me to also help founders. And uh, VR is very interesting because um, I had invested in a VR company um, you know, uh, through one of my entities very early on in the seed stage. And uh, they actually got acquired recently. And a lot of that had to do also with the right timing of this pandemic. So I can definitely speak more about that. Some other exits I've had is construction tech and also biotech. Um, I'm also still very active in investing in biotech and also in regulation tech, privacy. So I uh, look forward to you know sharing my thoughts and seeing how I can contribute to everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Tess. Um, and um, could you also um, let us know uh, what were the, some recent cases of your investments? Yes, happy to. So recent, I am still investing and um, I definitely have looked at, um, you know, the various areas that it you was know, especially, um, you know, focusing very much on FinTech blockchain. And uh, recently, um, through that experience of 10 years of looking at that, I have decided that uh, the next wave was going to be in privacy tech, regulation tech, because of the amount of data that all companies have access to, especially tech companies. And with AI and ML, machine learning uh, technology now becoming, you know, so, um, you know, able to be so uh, deeply um, uh, successful. That, uh, that means, you know, ample of data. So regulation tech, I am one of my top portfolio companies. Uh, I have invested in them because knowing that companies now are going to be governed by a privacy policy, it's regulated now. There's CCPA in, in uh, California and then uh, GDPR in Europe. So uh, this company is able to uh, focus first um, on a very good go-to-market strategy as their investor and advisor. And they've also you know, asked me to be, um, you know, also chairwoman of the, uh, you know, um, helping out the founding team. So I'm very honored. Uh, the CEO uh, is amazing uh, domain expertise background, and he has a great vision of what could be the future of compliance in a box, compliance as a service. So every tech company can just plug and play, um, ex plug and then implement this compliance process, which is very difficult to do. So that's why it's uh, you know um, an amazing complimentary team uh, that uh, have done this and I'm happy to work alongside with them. Uh, further, uh, they also focus on authentication, which means biometrics. Therefore, that fits right into touchless where you actually don't have to, you know, be touching various stuff. Um, so that has been also very uh, important. And uh, emerging markets are something that is uh, critical in blockchain, in fintech, and also uh, seeing this uh, opportunity, I help them um, design a strategy to focus first on Southeast Asia. But this, platform, this company is able to have global scalability, uh, you know, one country at a time. So that's why I, you know, definitely think um, that is a very interesting. Bio, bio, um, you know, biotech is very interesting because of the health concern that has raised in this pandemic period. So I think, uh, you know, combined, there's a lot of very interesting areas that we are seeing. Thank you so much. And um, um, I will pass the floor to Adrian to introduce himself as a co-moderator today. Hello, everybody. I was kicked out twice from this call, oh, so sorry for that. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and to uh, contribute to these events, which are very, very helpful, uh, not only during this period, but uh, spreading uh, very good knowledge and having a lot of uh, bright minds, uh, except myself, of course, uh, here. Uh, my name is Edo Niculescu. I'm involved with Faster Capital, which is a Dubai-based accelerator and incubator of uh, startups. I'm also a mentor in uh, Star Virgin Startups uh, program in uh, UK and involved as uh, CMO EMEA in Cloudcoin Consortium. And um, um, I see a huge, huge potential, especially in gaming. And... Um, 
I would like to to uh, take my uh, co-moderator role and uh, uh, um, ask the participants, the investor participants, our set of three questions for today. Uh, these are if uh, they have recent cases of investments, what does the new investment process look like and what are their best pivot success cases. And before, uh, before starting that, I would say that pivoting in business is a very, very simple, is a very, very simple and important process. And there are many startups who don't, which don't necessarily fail. They simply pivot towards something else because um, the definition of excellent companies is that they have first an excellent team. They are working together. And if they have an excellent team working together, they're able to pivot anytime in any direction and that startup will overcome failure and will become successful so uh, who wants to to take this uh, set of three questions please well i can i can talk about it but uh, just to give you an idea or an impression we don't usually work with startups uh, we get involved once uh, a company would require a growth capital, for example. Uh, but in our experience, I think five years back, we invested in a startup, which was very revolutionary. Um, and it's, it's one of our success um, case studies as well. Uh, so it was in um, health tech where that, that particular company or startup could actually, they worked on a um, on a platform which could diagnose depression in patients even before it happens. So it, obviously it analyzed a lot of data uh, and I think some, I wouldn't call it uh, AI, but I think a lot of machine learning was involved. Um, and, and that startup, uh, we started with a very, I think we went in at the seed investment level and it's grown to a considerable uh, size now. Uh, it's been five years since. Uh, but that's one of the experience I can share with startups. But other than that, we are highly, highly active in uh, uh, very large scale um, transactions, which would uh, range from anything above 20 million to about 200 million. That's our uh, sweet spot. Um, and um, uh, talking about that, uh, uh, some of the traditional or classic industries that we invest in or um, uh, find investors for or co-invest are in uh, mining, uh, renewables, um, health tech, uh, fintech, as well as, um, you know, real estate. Um, so we are quite active in the alternative investment space. Um, and initially, when I introduced myself, um, I'm very, very keen on uh, talking about or learning more about AI and how um, uh, uh, the other uh, panelists are uh, using AI uh, in a classic example. Like for example, uh, I've recently uh, become a director on a, like, like I mentioned, on a FinTech uh, wealth management platform. Uh, they are going to be using uh, robo, robo advisors uh, and it's, it's a hybrid model. They'll be using robo advisors plus you would have uh, wealth managers on board uh, because Thanks to coronavirus, thanks to pandemic, a lot of uh, these companies, financial institutions globally are looking to digitalize their uh, services because it's because there is very less face time that they have with their clients or customers. And th there is a way that they have to survive, like um, London, for example, which is so, so reliant on uh, services, especially financial services. Um, that's where AI and uh, uh, fintech uh, would play a major, major role um, going forward. So um, uh, that's that's my perspective. And uh, I would be interested to know how uh, other investors or other panelists are using AI uh, in their particular industries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the fact that you took the stand. Uh, I would also uh, uh, like to ask you um, a different question. How do you see the women leadership during this uh, pandemic times, <laughs> which are very, very uh, complicated, but uh, I, women, they have a special touch. <laughs> 
Well, I'm glad you say that, uh, but I think we have a lot more than the special touch, <laughs> for example. Um, I think uh, women and leadership, I, I don't like talking too much about it because, you know, I, I think of myself not as a woman leader, but I think of myself as a professional. So I'm competing here with uh, the men, the women or whoever else uh, uh, is in the industry. So it's it's. Um, it kind of um, uh, uh, dissolves uh, um, in you know in a in a in a long term because uh, you forget that you're a woman because the people that you're working with when you're talking about deal making or investing in startups or growth capital or talking to investors or corporates you forget that you're a woman you know you uh, your mindset is uh, I think. I very much think like a man sometimes. <laughs> and I think uh, uh, going forward, um, that, that's the kind of roles uh, most women will have to play. You will think like a woman. And I'm sure most of the men would also at some point of time have thought as a woman, you know, uh, think that what a woman would do um, in a given circumstance. So I think it, it kind of, uh, um, it, there's a lot of, uh, how do I say, intersection in qualities uh, uh, for women leaders. And, and the faster you adapt, the, uh, the more chances of survival, I would say. Thank you very much. By the way, as human beings, we all have a feminine and a masculine side. Um, sure. Next, uh, I would like to ask uh, Tess about all uh, these three subjects. And uh, of course, we'll, we'll start with the uh, different subject about women leadership, if we can open the discussion with that. How do you see? And um, uh, it would be great to put um, um, a beach uh, background <laughs> instead of a bridge. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> a picture background. Okay, so this is the only one I have. Next time I can do that. But okay, I think it's please. because I'm in San Francisco right now. And, um, you know, I thought this would be very fitting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so... Uh, I think, um, you know, um, the question about, you know, I love supporting other female founders because uh, they're, uh, the, you know, what they face um, is a little different from obviously men because of uh, the fact that um, this world that society has, you know, kind of shaped everyone. However, I really do believe in the last five years, especially, I mean, five, 10 years, the uh, support for female leadership and just uh, being able to express the difference in the uh, you know uh, issues that we all face has been a very more it has been a more supportive environment. And I myself um, always look to see if there are you know female founders that actually can have equal resilience and grit and be able to manage all the other interesting aspects that you know um, women do have to face as a founder as a you know um, even if they want to be an investor I always want to make sure if I can lend a hand I will um, I myself am um, you know the um, eldest sister of four siblings so two sisters two brothers so I grow up very as one of the boys or as one of the sisters right and being a startup founder right in college, like in university, um, I already had faced that, uh, you know, um, the fact that one, I was um, a very young founder. So I always had to act more mature, older, and then also being a female, then also being Asian. So all of this was, uh, you know, um, good training, good leadership, you know, um, you know, just um, being able to, you know, make me more resilient so that I can also understand and have the empathy of what other people face, especially if uh, it's a female founder. I personally have supported, um, you know, through some of my entities uh, that we that I invest in, um, I, uh, uh, female founders and sometimes husband and wife founders. So those are very interesting dynamics as entrepreneurs, as founders. But I would say this particular company, very proud of them. They actually, you know, in the last, just you know in the in within less than a decade like even less they have been uh they started the company they grew the company very successful brought on great vcs and then they were acquired for just under a billion dollars like about you know um under 800 million so 
that just really proves that, you know, whether you, you know, what, no matter what kind of formation the founding team is, um, everyone is needed. It's complementary skill set that you need. And I do believe the more diverse background the founding team has, the higher chances that you can build a successful company and also have a global reach. So um, I, I, I firmly do believe that. Um, in my portfolio, I have other invest uh, founders that are female, but I do look, I have a due diligence checklist. Uh, that is, uh, many of my friends think it has a very high bar, but that's only because, you know, I'm not supporting the female founder just because they're female, but because they are, they are as capable. And sometimes in some cases, you know, um, you know, just excel in their ability to build a company. They demonstrated that with their background, with their, you know, strengths, their drive, their grit. So, uh, I, I, I'm just very um, impressed with a lot of the people that I meet, probably because I'm sitting here in Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley attracts the best. And I also was fortunate to spend some time at Stanford uh, to get the best mentorship to learn from the best. Uh, that was between 2011 and 2013. So now today, a lot of the folks I have met at Stanford have now definitely moved on to great leadership roles. Many of them are you know, VCs on Sand Hill Road. Um, I've helped mentor or help, you know, uh, help them break into VC or help them start their company or incubate them. So some of them have gone on to be unicorns already. And I think that's why, um, you know, I've been investing to your second question uh, as actively as I can. Um, and I still am. And that's why I think uh, as an investor demonstrating good ability to pick founding teams that truly can take the company to the you know acquisition stage or exit stage, um, it's not easy for the founding team to do that, and it's also not easy for investors to have that opportunity to actually invest in them. So I'm a very proactive investor. I truly do believe in you know there's no free lunch in this world, even as investors. So you have to make sure you put in your best effort to help support these teams. So I I really do do that as best as I can, and that's why. It's 4.22 a.m. here in California, but I'm on this panel supporting, you know, Elena, Nadia, and Latoken, and all of you guys. Thank you very much for the commitment. This is the, the, the real deal of uh, mindset. Uh, next, uh, Vikas, please. Yeah, so thank you, Adrian. Uh, uh, you know, we, we made three investments recently in the last six weeks. Uh, one of them actually is uh, in the similar area as Tess mentioned, uh, which is in data privacy. Uh, this is a company that we've been invested for, you know, close to two years. Uh, essentially, you know, uh, we wanted to make sure that our existing portfolio is good before we made any new investments. So great opportunity. The sector is great. Uh, we are seeing great traction in the company and a global expansion. Uh, so that is why we invested in that company. Uh, there are two new investments we made. Uh, one of the companies uh, is like the Uber of drone servicing. So the drone industry is really taking off and there is a lot of regulation coming to ensure drones are airworthy. Uh, drones are properly serviced before they can fly. And these are expensive drones, uh, anything from $10,000 to $100,000. And each service costs a lot of money. So this company has built a AI platform that does preventive maintenance and connects them to the nearest service center. So amazing company, that's what we invested in. Uh, that's the second company. And third company is a FinTech company uh, that we recently took a seed investment in. So I think, you know, uh, money is, there's still a lot of money in the world. Uh, there is a lot of money being invested. Uh, but the, the key, uh, you know, message is that the companies need to show that they are able to withstand what's happening in the market. Because what's happened is that uh, people thought initially in February that, or January that this is a China problem and it'll go away. Then they thought that, yeah, it's a short-term problem. Uh, maybe some things will change, but most of the world will be the same. Uh, then in March, you know, it started impacting many other countries. So the situation has snowballed very quickly. Uh, but I think a lot of people are still lagging from where they should be and where they are. So as investors, the first question that we ask people is, that how have you, how are you managing the current situation? And what is it that you're looking out 
uh, in the market. So companies have had to change their business models. Companies have had to change the way they sell. Uh, companies have had to drop customers. So I have one company, uh, you know, some, they are a B2B company. A lot of their clients don't give them access over VPN. They require their people to come physically and work in Switzerland and US uh, because a lot of the data they handle is, is quite private. Uh, so anybody who did not give VPN access to the company, we decided to drop all those customers because it's not humanly possible to service some of those customers. So I would say the business models have evolved. Uh, you know, companies have had to think how, for example, some of the B2B companies, uh, they've never had to do any online sales. Now they are in an in a, in a environment where the entire B2B sales have to happen online. Now, how do you do that? There are no successful case studies around that. So that's something that, you know, companies are working on. So essentially the fact is that, uh, you know, companies need to move quickly. Uh, companies need to look at the sales, their business models, their revenue, uh, their cost model, how they service the customers and a lot of other stuff because some of these changes are not temporary. Uh, some of these changes are going to be permanent. Uh, some of the demand will come back when the economy starts picking up. Some of that demand may only come back 70% or 60%. And some of that demand may only come back 40%. So the entire world has changed and companies need to think uh, how they are looking and managing this environment before they can go and ask investors more money. So no shortage of money, uh, provided you can prove that you are able to manage yourself in this environment. And if you are able to successfully demonstrate that, you are worth your weight in gold. Because if you can survive this, you can survive virtually anything. Correct. Thank you very much, Vikas. Next, Andy, please, your point of view regarding the three topics. Sure, sure. I, I think from, from, from my work that I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm very much known for the, my work uh, done with the uh, several governments uh, on blockchain. So when I look at the investments uh, nowadays, I tend to look at things uh, slightly different from, uh, from, from, from the past because during the COVID-19 period, you know, um, a lot of uh, companies are actually now given a chance to become uh, uh, maybe a, an, an unicorn themselves, you know. So we, we look at um, very practical things such as, uh, you know, the kind of potential they could, they could bring back to the, to the industry after uh, the COVID uh, uh, crisis and also during the COVID price crisis. So most of the time, we will look at uh, companies that are, uh, putting a lot of effort into the technology part. So VR, AI would be something that, we're, that we are very much focused on. Um, and, of, and of course, we talk about the esports, gaming and, and, and so forth that I'm very much involved in in South Korea. Um, what are the more recent things that we, we got ourselves uh, uh, involved in? You know, we, we spend a lot more time to develop, um, to develop teams, you know, to work with uh, founders we spend a lot more time to develop some of their technology because we felt that, you know, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis period, um, it is actually the best time for you to invest into technology and build the capability that you need. So the recent investments that we, we have put forth are, uh, are some uh, more practical. For example, you know, one of them are, are, are game overlay, uh, esports game overlay, where they are given tasks uh, you know, to do on uh, leading games like Fortnite and so forth. You know, they, are, they, they do, they do the, the, the task they need and then they get a kind of uh, advertising revenue or some uh, uh, gaming revenue from the pool. So these are some of the things that, that, that we look at. And um, the whole process of uh, investment, um, you know, looking at the due diligence and so forth, those are the same, you know, but right now, you know, we, we, we spend a lot more time in uh, some of these uh, startups that, 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 that we, we work very closely with. Because if you look at the statistics um, for the first quarter, you know, for game startup, there are about 700 million invested into game startup. And then, you know, in the gaming industry alone, there are M&A deals that can be worth up to about $1.6 billion. So for us, you know, we spend a lot more time in the gaming sector and and um, um, we look at a lot on uh, esports uh, collaboration, which is something that's more practical. You know, the, 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 the industry is still running, people are still playing games. And we felt that that 
uh, some of the efforts that we put in uh, right now to uh, build on our portfolio. And if you look at uh, what, I, what I'm doing right now, I'm also the chairperson for Descent uh, Foundation. We are a main net. So we have our own product uh, called uh, Alex, A-L-A-X. This is a blockchain uh, app store for gamers uh, to provide a delivery of games and payment globally, um, utilizing the power of blockchain. This is some of the things that we are doing. And surprisingly, during this period of time, we have a lot of uh, 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 big companies. Some of them are even listed who are seeking uh, um, technology from us to see how they could advance their, their, their gaming empire. You know? So some of them are into casino online and some of them are into uh, you know, esports on, online. And, and these are some of the things that we, 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 we kept doing. So some of the success story that we will see you know, after the, the COVID-19 would be like what Tess has mentioned, you know, talking about privacy, talking about uh, digital proofing, some of the uh, existing uh, 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 companies that are, that are available. Because after the, the, the crisis, you know, many people will start to look at things very differently. They work more online. A lot of their business could be 99% digitized and so forth. So the effort of uh, digitally proofing something or tracking something become a lot more relevant. Uh, same, same goes for privacy. Thank you very much. And uh, Rahul, please. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to highlight trends and investment outlook in the gaming industry in India as a from India. Uh, I want to also put some points. Gaming in the market is gaining a good traction in Asia Pacific, primarily India with a total market size of 1.5 US billion. For example, Indian Fo uh, recently Indian Air Force officially launched its gaming mobile app to create an interest of kids and youth in tourism and services. I want to highlight uh, some of the recent investments in gaming industry in India. Uh, let's say Bazi Games invest uh, USD 5 million. Uh, recently, a group of investors invest approx uh, 35.5 million in the mobile Premier League game. Uh, there is one more game called Dream Lab One. He raised USD 60 million. Since the Indian government and private players investing in mobile gaming application, it has an excellent scope in developing the gaming ecosystem in India. Uh, from uh, from the gaming industry, I want to correlate virtual reality, virtual reality with the gaming industry. If we talk about VR in gaming, VR is trending in the gaming industry that have got benefited this immersive technology. What's the pivot? With time, more and more developers start taking an interest in VR games. This has changed the picture of the games by creating new VR content or changing past content. What we have learned from this pandemic and what's the benefit is when this pandemic provided any benefit to us? Yes. We all witnessed that mobile screen time increase exponentially. In coming in years, this pandemic is going to play a wider role for gaming industry. Thank you. Thank you very much also. Um, should we go to the pitch section or uh, does anybody have something more to say? I would like to say uh, something. <laughs> uh, if it's possible with the travel restrictions regarding the investment process, it's basically much easier today to, to pitch investors because uh, in the past you needed a lot of travel to, to discuss with some investors face to face. But now this thing is like a mission impossible in, in many places. So um, really the pitching pro process can be replaced by a one-to-one -one call, which was not a common practice like um, um, six months before that. Yes, thank you so much, Adrian, uh, for your comment and uh, great co-moderation role. And uh, we'll pass on the floor to uh, our projects. Today we have um, uh, Andrew Antar, co-founder of TuneFM. Would you please join us uh, with your screen sharing of um, Pitch Deck? Thank you. You have five minutes to go. All right. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Can everyone see my screen? 
Yes, that's beautiful. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, uh, very nice to meet you all. I'm Andrew Antar, and I'm the founder of Tune.fm. And Tune.fm is a music streaming um, micro. It's a music streaming platform and marketplace that has an integrated cryptocurrency that powers micro payments directly to artists for every second of streaming. So essentially the music market is inherently broken and the business model uh, pays out mostly to the publishers and the publishers and rights holders only pay artists less than 10%. Um, yet there's a huge growth in streaming in the last few years and the, the global revenue growth of the music industry is finally um, on an uptick after basically contracting over the last two decades. Um, but there's still many barriers to entry and artists get less than half a penny per stream. And it takes the rights holders sometimes over two years to pay artists. And especially in this global pandemic, artists main revenue stream of, of live shows and tickets and merch has been virtually cut off and so the only revenue stream for artists now is through digital platforms. And so it's, it's increasingly necessary that a new business model um, and monetization uh, is, is brought forth so that artists can actually earn directly from their streaming services um, instead of waiting two years to get paid less than 10%. So our mission is to, to democratize music and access to music for all by leveling the playing field for artists and enabling artists to go direct to fan where they actually control their rights and disintermediating the marketplace by cutting out the middlemen. And what this at the end of the day um, allows artists to actually earn a living uh, just through their actual creative content and their music, uh, which they can share through our platform and earn directly for. So we've built a music discovery platform um, with an in-game cryptocurrency, um, which automatically directly compensates artists for every second of streaming. So when the music gets played, the artist gets paid and we're able to sort the music algorithmically. And we've built core audio technology that enables high fidelity lossless masters to be uploaded and compressed and streamed anywhere in the world. And so we have over 5,000 artists around the world, including multiple, uh, uh, medium and larger size music labels in addition to independent artists. And we enable that through a non-exclusive hybrid license, which allows artists to directly uh, license their music to their fans and receive cryptocurrency um, as, as compensation for that music. So we've actually built a very novel uh, technology uh, token. It's not uh, just an ERC-20 on Ethereum, but we're We've built the first and only token to run on Hedera Hashgraph, which is the next generation distributed ledger technology. And it actually goes beyond blockchain. It's a distributed acyclical graph that is asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant. So essentially it has enterprise, enterprise grade security that is uh, where the consensus is, is reaches finality and it's, provable through, through math proofs. Um, and it's all governed by a distributed governance council and a proof of stake virtual voting consensus algorithm. And some of the advantages of Hashgraph are the fact that it's lightning fast with over 100,000 transactions per second, uh, very low fee structure, and the throughput is incredibly high. And so what that enables us to do is do pay as you go micropayments, uh, which is a totally new business model, which is not possible through fiat or other high fee, uh, low throughput blockchains. Um, and so because of that, we've developed the only token that's running on Hashgraph and it's our own standard protocol where we've created a sharding architecture with parent and child smart contracts to enable um, to scale the token to millions of users with millions of accounts. Um, and this allows us to create an entire economy uh, for music and ecosystem of decentralized micropayments between artists and fans, all running on the trusted Hedera Hashgraph public ledger. So the, the JAM token is, is the name of the token that's running under the hood uh, within the Tune.fm platform. So we presented at Hedera 18, the conference for Hedera, and we were also accepted to the Hedera DAP accelerator in Hong Kong called 
Helix, and we've uh, been working very closely as partners uh, with Hedera. So the way the Jam token works is both artists and fans can actually earn uh, cryptocurrency uh, through their activity. It's sort of like a music game in where we, we gamify different uh, levels and incentives with badges and rewards. Um, so fans can actually earn tokens for streaming new music that they're discovering. And then they can earn tokens for curating that music as well and helping out the artists. And so the artists can market their music um, by purchasing essentially first time streams and new fans. Um, and so that first stream pays out to the listener um, because they've never heard that music before. And then when they stream the music again, uh, those streams pay back to the artist. So the artist essentially earns 90% um, of the jam for every stream and 10% goes back in to fill the treasury, which makes up 20% of the total supply of tokens. Um, so we have also a proof of stream audio protocol, which allows us to verify that it's the first time streamer and the, the fan actually gets a whole dashboard. Um, the artist can see through their proof of stream dashboard, who's streaming their music, who their new fans are, how much time they streamed every single song. So there's a great deal of transparency um, and they get to see exactly where their music is trending, what locations, um, and whether their investment into their marketing of their music is actually paying off. So we also have a fiat on-ramp and on off-ramp through our partners with Carbon, uh, which has a, a stable coin. Essentially, we exchange that directly for Jam. Uh, so it's totally SEC compliant because we're a US-based company. And instead of having a subscription service, which is sort of one size fits all, um, every user gets 100 Jam tokens when they sign up and they can pay as you go, they can buy more or they can earn, they can break even. And in many cases, they're spending just a few dollars per month for an equivalent amount of streaming on Spotify or they could even earn uh, that amount um, or just break even depending on how they use the platform. So it's, it's very flexible based on how your usage is actually um, on the platform. And so we have a, a stabilization for the, the token so that the price per minute of streaming, which we actually pay out for every second, is stabilized as the price of the token changes. Um, and another technology that we developed in addition to the sharded architecture and token protocol on Hashgraph is a managed wallet uh, for the user and private key custody. So we've created a very simplified and seamless UX for onboarding uh, new customers and them not having to deal with a lot of the um, complexities of cryptocurrency with seed phrases and if they lose their password, they lose their tokens. So we actually have a multi-sig wallet recovery system uh, where users can recover their private keys while they're still encrypted and there's no way for, for us as the provider um, of being able to break into their account or any hacker uh, who, who might hack into the system. Um, and we've also uh, white labeled all of these services, both the token service as well as the key custody service as uh, an API. So anyone can actually access uh, Hedera Hashgraph services. So any DAP could potentially um, have their own token or get the uh, managed key private custody service. And so all of that, there's we've actually have a ton of companies interested in and licensing that directly from us as well. So this is the Jam Token wallet, and essentially it's a Hedera account as well as the Jam Solidity Smart Contract address. And we show the rate for streaming of how much you'll earn uh, as people stream your music and the current price, uh, which is currently fixed, but once it's on various exchanges, we'll be floating. Um, and so in the activity, you can see the debits and credits to your wallet, which all happen automatically as you're streaming music and using the DAP. Uh, so we're essentially creating a totally new business model for the music industry, utilizing micropayments, which are only now possible uh, with this new cryptocurrency and is only really possible to do micropayments in this way using their hash graph. Um, so this is allowing artists to actually earn directly and instantly for their music as it's streamed uh, in a pay-as-you-go model, which has never happened before. So my brother and I are co-founders 
and we started this originally in our dorm room. We also were both developers and designers, and we also have two other developers. Daniel's our CTO, and Raul is a, probably the leading Hashgraph developer, and Paul's our communications director, who's also done a lot of work for Particle. Um, and so we've put together a very esteemed advisory board of both the music industry and cryptocurrency. Um, probably the most notable here is Matthew Knowles, who's Beyonce's father, and he owns the Music World Entertainment label, uh, which has over 5,000 songs. And so we've built an entire label um, dashboard and bulk uploading system. So we can enable, we can handle an entire catalogs of thousands of songs. And so on our platform that in addition to the thousands of independent artists, we also have dozens of Grammy award-winning artists, including uh, Beyonce live tracks as well. Um, and so we've raised around 750,000 to date. And the most recent investment was through the Helix Accelerator. Um, and so Andy Hertzfeld was actually our first angel investor and he co-created the Macintosh. Um, he's based in Palo Alto. And um, we've had several other an angels involved as well, as well as Brown Venture Labs through Brown University um, where I originally came. And so MindFund is also what backed uh, the Helix Accelerator. Um, so we've actually, the way we accumulate all these artists is through a lot of grassroots marketing. We did a lot of events at South by Southwest, a lot of live shows uh, in which we uh, put together and sponsored and had uh, marketing teams um, basically all around the country and all around the world who were uh, bringing artists on board. And so we've done a lot of the hard work and enabled um, our social media to scale that up, uh, to bring in artists of all different types, all different genres from all around the world. So thank you for listening. And that's essentially our, our product, Tune.fm, and the company's called Hero.fm. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I pass the floor to the second project to pitch today. It's Jeffrey Liu, CEO of Xampu. Uh, Jeffrey, please join us uh, with your screen sharing mode. Thanks. Hey, guys. Uh, yeah. Let me just share my screen really quickly. Can you guys see the screen? Yes, thank you. That's good. OK, um, great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeffrey, and I am a co-founder of Zenpool. So we are a fintech infrastructure company that makes sending money and cryptocurrencies across the world faster, cheaper, lower risk. And we do this essentially by automating traditional payment methods and by using high liquidity cryptocurrencies. So. Cryptocurrencies, to me, were invented to actually reduce intermediaries within finance. Uh, but ironically, in the current states, the people who want to actually buy and sell these assets, especially in a lot of the emerging markets where we operate, these people have to contend with a lot of intermediary processes like FX brokers, wire transfers, custodians, uh, trading fees, and withdrawal fees. Now, all of these processes add additional middlemen and intermediaries between the buyer and seller, forcing most people to have to pay higher fees, waste more time, and also take unnecessary risk, like leaving custody of your assets on a third-party platform. Now, to solve this problem, uh, me and my co-founder, Artem, we have redesigned how local currency to cryptocurrency transactions ought to be processed. So we built our own financial infrastructure um, that can instantly settle transactions in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, without actually taking custody of our customer assets. So the reason we're able to do this is because we work closely with our group of now 200 curated liquidity peers. These are the entities that you see on the right side of the screen who essentially provide our network direct uh, access by giving us API access into their local payment methods. Uh, this is These payment methods are things like Alipay, FPS in Hong Kong, which is a direct way of debiting between bank accounts and UPI in India. So our software can monitor and actually trigger transactions to and from these liquidity providers' financial infrastructure. So these liquidity peers, they are prime brokerages, crypto funds, and even individuals who are willing to hold both their respective local currency and cryptocurrency on their own books and subsequently earn fees on them. 
So our business model is super simple. Uh, we charge a transaction fee for all successful transactions that go through Zenpool. And each converted user currently earns us about 42 USD annually. Now, we do expect this number to go up and rise as we expand our services into different verticals that I will briefly mention later on. Now, because of our architecture, our transactions don't have any costs associated with them. And what I mean by this is that any cost that is generated in sending these payments is absorbed either by the bank or the payment platform itself. Um, just ask yourself, how much money does it cost to send a FPS transaction in Hong Kong or an Alipay transaction or a UPI transaction in India? It's actually free. And because of that, our costs will always be lower than that of our competitors that require middleman services like custodians. I would even go as far as to say that we offer our customers the best of all worlds. The good rates that high liquidity exchanges offer them, the instantaneousness of crypto ATMs and the versatility of payment that traditional peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces offer their customers. Now, right now, Zenpool is fully operational in these countries. And within the next six quarters, we'll also be fully functional within the top 20 economies of the Eastern Hemisphere. This includes uh, mainland China, Russia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Korea, Japan, etc. So while we are expanding into these different jurisdictions, we're also going to expand our product offering itself. Uh, we started out as a company that has built the lowest cost possible way of processing local to cryptocurrency payments. But this infrastructure that we've built is not only applicable to this use case, um, but also applicable to traditional online merchant payment processing. So imagine an Indian merchant in India being able to accept Hong Kong dollars through FPS or Alipay, while he himself will receive rupees directly through UPI into his Indian bank account within a few minutes. Now, we've already signed various partnership agreements with uh, several e-commerce software providers in Southeast Asia, like Volusion, BCommerce, Wads. And uh, one of our investors is actually also the founder of Lazada, and he's committed to bring our payment solution onto their platform, assuming it's been properly tested and uh, can actually handle their transaction requirements. So the team is led by myself as the CEO and my co-founder, Artem, as the CTO. We're both very technical co-founders, so we know how to build these kinds of platforms securely and scalably. We also have a track record of being able to grow uh, small B2C startups into highly valuable and profitable companies for our shareholders like I did at SnapAsk. Now, in the last four quarters of operations, uh, well, these this slides are uh, actually a month old, but last month uh, we've acquired in total, cumulatively, over 25,000 transacting customers. Uh, we've signed service agreements and are partnered with companies like Binance, OKX, uh, Bybit, uh, these large cryptocurrency platforms in the space to use our fiat gateway on their platforms. Last month, uh, two months ago, we did over 5 mil USD of gross transaction volumes, and we are still growing at a monthly rate of around 20% month on month. So. Actually, right now, uh, we are right towards the end of closing our pre-A round of financing. Uh, the transaction documents are going to be signed late this week or early next week. So it's very unlikely that uh, anyone watching is able to join unless you're comfortable moving very fast, which is not a position I want to put you in. However, uh, we are a very fast growing fintech company, and I'd love to keep in touch with you uh, and to potentially get the conversation started for any potential future round of financing. So after this chat, um, I'm going to copy and paste my contact information in the chat and um, I'd love to catch up with you guys afterwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. So uh, we'll have our evaluation forms uh, filling in by um, our investor panel uh, participants. So I will give a word to each of you to uh, give some feedback on the project, uh, which uh, we just um, which we've heard today. So Andy, are you ready with the feedback? Um, hi. I mean, uh, we, we, we have uh, heard, heard from uh, Jeffrey a few times. Uh, we, we know the project very well. 
Um, as for uh, Andrew, uh, I, I like what Tune is uh, is uh, doing because whatever they are trying to do right now is going to change uh, how the music industry is going to work. And at the same time, they are also going to change how the gaming industry is going to work because these two industries are very much closely linked. And I see that uh, putting forth the uh, cryptocurrency aspects to the whole business is going to help the music industry and uh, help a lot of uh, independent uh, music makers as well, you know, to uh, create music together and uh, share the, uh, the, the, the rights, the royalty and so forth. And that would really uh, change how this whole industry is going to work. I, I've encountered a few uh, very similar projects. One of them is in uh, Norway and then another one is, uh, is uh, looking at the Chinese market. You know, so I think all, all, of, all, all of these uh, companies should start to work together and then use different protocol to, uh, to, to spread the, 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 the good, the good uh, use case studies you know, on how blockchain can fit very nicely into the music and gaming industry. So I think, I, I think Andrew has a, has a bit of a competitive advantage you know, in, in, this, uh, in this time of uh, pandemic. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Andy. Cass, what do you think? Yeah, so, uh, Jeffrey, very interesting presentation. Uh, I think payments industry. Uh, thank is, you so uh, much, Andy. Because what do you think? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we do. Yes. Okay. So, thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. I think very interesting presentation. Uh, the payments industry is actually the worst in terms of uh, you know the amount they take in between. Uh, commission charges, uh, conversion, uh, the fee income for banks is like, you know, huge. And uh, they are quite scared in terms of uh, new things that are happening in this uh, market. So what I'm quite impressed is the number of users you've accumulated in a short period of time that shows that there is a lot of interest. Uh, second, I think that Lazada is, is like a game changer for you. So if you can get that uh, on your platform, that I think uh, can overnight uh, create a very different valuation in terms of what you're doing. So certainly I think a great industry, great market. Uh, you, you're doing some excellent work there. So very impressed with that. Uh, Andrew, I think the music industry is also ripe for some disruption. Uh, it's been like, you know, about 10 years or 15 years since Apple disrupted it in a big way. Uh, but still, I think it didn't really change some of the bigger challenges of what you spoke about the artists really not getting full control of what they do. Uh, so while the industry is huge, uh, it's also very tough. So you will see a lot of uh, resistance uh, from the big label companies. You will also see a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, I, I think you need uh, you know, more money, uh, more marketing, uh, more of everything to take it on a global scale. Uh, but I think idea is certainly interesting. Uh, you know, what you've built, the model is quite nice. Uh, you know, one needs to see the robustness of that. Uh, you know, artists need to feel comfortable with that. Uh, they may have to agree to not be able to go with labels if they go with you. So some of the early artists and early adopters would be key. And if you can get some of them as brand ambassadors for you, uh, that will be a big advantage. Thank you so much, Vikas and Adrian. Uh, um... I liked very much both projects. Xangpool uh, for sure fills a gap in, uh, in the market regarding the costs and the rapidity of transactions. And uh, I believe is on track to major milestones. Um, of course, being a, um, a music producer myself, I resonated emotionally with what Tune FM is doing. And um, um, I believe there is huge, huge opportunity for the next generation of startups after Spotify and the other giants today, because will be in the next period, a huge shift in how the music distribution is made and how the artists are paid. And one thing which uh, uh, you should do as a platform um, most of the very successful artists, and it's very good that you have the father of Beyonce in, uh, in uh, the advisory board, besides being artists, they are entrepreneurs, as Beyonce is. So uh, many of the independent artists also should be taught about how to become entrepreneurs and to actually control their financial destiny. And I believe by adding a lot of education for that, 
you could differentiate yourself from all the other startups basically fighting for the same uh, for the same objective thank you very much very good projects thank you and uh, priyanka yeah uh, thank you um, uh, thank you nadia uh, thank you jeffrey and uh, thank you andrew for those uh, good presentations uh, uh, from my perspective uh, and from uh, looking at coronavirus and the other uh, uh, restraints uh, in the markets currently i i think both the projects have have an edge in their particular industries but uh, for me, I think the payment industry is going to get very, very interesting, and especially the markets that Jeffrey spoke about. Like, for example, you're talking about India and China, where these uh, payment gateways are, are like they became uh, billionaires overnight. You know, some things like Paytm and uh, Alipay, they're, they're doing so well. And I think disruption in this particular industry, uh, especially utilizing blockchain and cryptocurrencies, could be could be the next uh, game changer, uh, but at the same time, uh, looking at Andrew's project, uh, um, Leon FM, I think that, that also has an edge because I think the music industry hasn't had much di disruption. Uh, uh, the last we heard was Spotify, and then things have kind of cooled down. But I think there is there is a lot of need, and like Vikas pointed out, there are obviously uh, he needs uh, Andrew needs to. Uh, get the funding in, uh, invest a lot into marketing and uh, uh, getting the right uh, brand ambassadors to promote his uh, um, uh, brand would be would be crucial because in, in this industry, it's all about uh, uh, who represents you, I think. Uh, so yeah, the, the, both very interesting projects. Uh, but uh, if I had to choose one, I would, uh, again, my inclination is towards uh, the music industry. But if I were to look at just from the investor perspective, I think um, Jeffrey has uh, something uh, which could be monetized much quicker. Thank you so much, Priyanka. And uh, Raul? Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Jeffrey, and thank you, Andrew. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, Jeffrey presentation. Your presentation is good and interesting. Even your idea is very interesting. And it's good to see your, your presence and idea can be in the several countries. From my point of view, the only challenge, what I thought that is the government policies, as it's keep on changing, financial policies and every each and every country has their different uh, prospect, different perspective, different policies. Is in India we're talking about the fair We have to think and have to go through that. How, for example, in coming years and coming, they will keep on changing. So from that point of view, we have to think about. It. You have to keep in mind those policies changes always. Uh, for Andrew, uh, thank you for the presentation. Your presentation is good, but I just I thought that there's no entry barrier in your field. As we we can say, there's a lots of music streaming uh, companies are into the market so from for you just that one thank you thank you so much raul and uh, tas and your final feedback hi yes uh, i think both uh, you know founder uh, founders of um, andrew and jeffrey both have um, very solid uh, very good value proposition and both are tackling a market that i think um, probably needs to be addressed there are so many pain points um, let's talk first um, about um, uh, you know jeffrey's so that's an area that i personally because of been investing in fintech and also blockchain, crypto, um, you know, crypto-based uh, companies, and obviously exchanges um, in the year of 2018, 2019 uh, became one of the some of the hottest uh, investments from VCs. I myself is no different with my VC friends. We all looked at many exchanges, um, and that led us to understand that the up to crypto gateway is absolutely, you know, uh, the challenge and the pain point of bridging mass adoption. So I definitely looked deep into this. Um, 
very uh, lucky that uh, a lot of my um, good friends are uh, those at Binance um, and Huabi, uh, you know, and also obviously um, OK. So, you know, the bigger uh, uh, the bigger exchanges who are also looking to solve. Um, obviously, Binance has a great vision in this area um, and have been leading the charge globally, uh, along with, you know, other folks like um, Gate.io have done well. Uh, Kraken, the CFO, is a good friend. So it's very exciting to see all your, you know, um, uh, various uh, potential partners and partners that you are, you know, uh, going to be working with. Um, and also, I think uh, what is interesting is your Southeast Asia, um, you know, already uh, presence because. Um, as everyone know, um, I've been invited to speak a lot on uh, panels with Elena and also with uh, Nadia. So I spent one of my thesis in my you know f uh, fund is to invest in Southeast Asia. And in order to you know dominate Southeast Asia, you need to dominate Indonesia. So Lazada, obviously, I've had a lot of founding team members that are you know core people that have now come up to start startups, and a lot of them are unicorns. So that's why. I personally, the um, regulatory company, the startup uh, that I'm you know, helping, that I advise and invested in, I actually strategically, they're based out of Silicon Valley. They hire engineers from Canada, which is very strategic um, because we are, I myself am a Canadian, now living in the States the last 10 years. Um, we have some of the best you know, on engineers and price arbitrage. Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia, is the go-to-market strategy that I help them design and I spent half my time actually over in Jakarta. So um, I've helped them raise three, you know, over $3 million uh, in a seed round. And they are now laser focused on product delivery. So we, I've already lined up my friends over at Tokopedia, Bukalapa, Traveloka, Blibli. So that's why, um, you know, seeing a company that actually understands like the global need, the fiat to crypto, and also being able to already have good inroads there. Obviously, I think I saw that you're based out of Singapore, which is excellent because that's, you know, a very friendly blockchain crypto area. So, you know, I'm happy to also help, um, you know, uh, you know, bridge and make more intros, whether it's in investors or actually uh, Indodax and, you know, any of the other exchanges that you think, you know, would be meaningful and helpful to you. Um, what is interesting is in Indonesia, I've been asked by um, a lot of my friends that actually are part of the government that has been, um, you know, the key leaders in fintech. They've actually asked, they said, we love to learn more about blockchain and, you know, understand how crypto is going to play affect an uh, a impact on all the banks and how it's going to be disrupted. So I've been asked to, you know, educate them. So the next time when COVID allows us all to fly, you know, is over and the borders are open, I will be, you know, making um, and sharing PowerPoint presentations. So, you know, happy if that's something that's interesting to you that I can also help uh, bridge. So um, I think that, um, you know, some things that I would love to ask a little bit more about is, um, you know, how much have you um, raised? You may have mentioned that, but I missed that. I know that for Andrews, he raised, you know, um, three quarter million, 750,000. But uh, I think I missed how much you have already raised. How long have you guys been operating? And I know you say, uh, you mentioned you're about to get a term sheet that you're closing, but how much are you raising in this current round? Um, and then the next, uh, you know, obviously, um, my biggest um, sharing to a lot of founders and startup is advisors and investors are some of your key assets. It's super important. And you guys both have great uh, notable um, advisors to really utilize them and hope that some of them will be even more committed to helping your startup out of their whole portfolio. And therefore they can actually be, you know, um, actually sharing a lot of the uh, pain points that you share and help you think through that and help you accelerate, you know, faster into the future. I love, you know, fast cars. I've um, been very lucky that after, you know, um, my company that I started in undergrad with my co-founder, uh, we got three acquisitions after, after we graduated. That's the reason why I started my own fund is so that I can pay it forward and help other founders at the early stage. So my sweet spot is investing in early stage. That's when it is the toughest for founders and founding team to be able to handle the multifaceted of responsibility and challenges that are faced at them. Yet they have such great vision. So they, I, I understand that deeply coming from you know a founder myself and someone who operated and grew a company from A to Z is how do you help them you know 
share some of that um, burden and help them accelerate. So I bring up cars is I like to say uh, with my due diligence bar and um, being able to access such great founders and I guess, you know, deal flow in my pipeline sitting here in Silicon Valley and also very fortunate to spend time at Stanford. I see a lot of different startups and, you know, um, you know, great companies coming out. Uh, but what I always say is that I like to choose and be able to, um, you know, um, partner and help founders out. And when I do, you know, hopefully when I identify these teams that I do decide to advise and invest in, they are like, you know, BMWs or Mercedes, you know, at that level. And then with my help, hopefully I can help accelerate them so that, you know, they already have a lot covered and so much potential and done so much. But if my, you know, involvement can help, I can help accelerate them like a Ferrari or, you know, at the highest level of Bugatti. Um, as you can tell, I like uh, definitely cars and I do track racing myself. Um, I think that comes from the entrepreneur investor side where I think the risk taking aspect I love but it's controlled risk. That's why, you know, racing in a track, you know, with other um, like-minded trained people is uh, very rewarding. And also, you know, uh, it comes with a lot of uh, the experience of an entrepreneur. So that's why I think, um, you know, those are some things I wanted to ask. And then for um, Andrew's side, uh, maybe I should ask Jeffrey first and then I can come back to Andrew. Yeah, so that was how much have you raised and how much are you planning on raising? I know you say, you know, this round is... Uh, kind of, you know, locked up, which is excellent. Um, so that's something I can start with. And then you talk about, you know, Andrew's company. Sure. Uh, we've raised half a mil so far, uh, USD. Uh, then now we're right two weeks away from closing our pre-A round, uh, pre-Series A round, whereby we are raising around 3.5 M. So that will likely close within two weeks. That's excellent. And how long has the company been operating and what's roughly the burn rate monthly? So last last year, February, we built an MVP. Um, March, we incorporated the company. Then our monthly burn to today, so this month it would be around 20 to 30K USD. Yeah, that's impressive. I mean, everything is well bootstrapped. The vision is... Um, absolutely needed of uh, the solution, the product and the technology that you are building and going to market with. I really want to see more teams, uh, you know, solving the pain points that you are doing become successful because otherwise we're not going to have mass adoption. I firmly believe blockchain is a, a frontier technology that needs to happen. And um, it's widely available. It's widely applicable to so many areas, but people don't understand it because there has been bad characters in the ecosystem. But, um, you know, blockchain, obviously, you know, there's a component of crypto. There's never any opportunity to escape that, but we need credible teams that's able to help facilitate and bridge that. So um, I've been super, you know, patient waiting for the ecosystem to go through the different cycles it needs to. There has to be the proper regulation. So that's why, um, you know, I'm happy definitely to lend a hand. I, you know, looked into the whole fiat crypto gateway from Southeast Asia to, you know, obviously Asia, China, Korea, and Latin America, which with everything there of what's happening in the currency instability is also very uh, a, a, a area region that is highly able to adopt some of the uh, offerings that we all see right now and uh, you know need from uh, what you're doing so thank you so much and then uh, with Andrew um, thank you for your feedback your, thank you you're tackling an area that is dear to my heart um, I always envy those who you know can sing and express passionately uh, in this area. And therefore I love listening to music. Um, so that's why I think what you're doing is excellent. I've helped um, advise a few teams that are that were tackling the music industry. Um, and uh, it was very challenging. Um, you know, they kind of had it, but then there were many areas that actually became the bottleneck. So that's why um, I just want to make sure you guys able to hear me. Yes, yes, we hear you well. Okay, perfect, because the screen seemed to freeze. Okay, perfect. So with Andrew, um, I, um, you know, I, I would love to look more into what you're doing because uh, with um, very early Sonos, when that came about, that technology, uh, which was very basic back then, I was like already an avid, you know, user. Then Pandora, Spotify, 
And then obviously, you know, everything else that we have now, everyone has a music component to it. So uh, I think, you know, what you're doing using, um, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrency providing that stickiness is, um, you know, uh, definitely needed. And uh, various teams have tried to tackle this. Um, your advisory is an impressive, obviously, uh, being able to um, bring on uh, Beyonce's dad. He will obviously be able to help you open up um, the floodgate of many, uh, you know, great uh, clients and pipeline and along with your other advisory board. Um, I know you mentioned you're raised, you, you've raised 750000 I think you mentioned. Um, and how much are you looking to raise currently? And what is your uh, burn rate? And kind of how close are you to thinking about, you know, meeting your KPIs and what would you say are your KPIs, how, KPIs and how are you measuring it? Um, and, you know, kind of, um, you know, what investors need to know in terms of, you know, um, top of mind for us is, you know, return on investment. Uh, besides being able to support a impressive team um, and the uh, impact that you will make, which all those obviously I think you have covered. But the capital part, if you can share and talk a little bit about that, that would be excellent. Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, our our previous round was an angel round. So uh, all the investors were individual angel investors, but we're now opening up a round in the next week of 1.5 million. And so it's it's under a safe T note, which is a safe a safe note with a token option. So you can essentially invest in for either equity or for tokens. And so we've uh, discounted the token price uh, to three cents as and the equity with the Eight million pre-money uh, valuation cap, and for the first five hundred thousand, we're offering an additional twenty percent discount on both the equity, as well as in the conversion, as well as the the token price. Um, we have about um, around half a million committed so far from various funds and angels, and uh, we're capping it at at one point five. So it's it's a smaller raise, but that's what we need to actually get to the next milestone, which for us is is listing the token on various exchanges. So we're also talking to OKX, um, Shortex, Liquid, um, obviously La Token and others. Um, we also have some connections at Binance and we want to get in a very solid legal foundation uh, before we we uh, do the, the Binance and the larger exchanges. Um, but basically uh, some of our, our KPIs are, are transaction volume. So we've already processed 25,000, over 25,000, probably closer to 30,000 transactions on the Hedera Hashgraph network, um, just through uh, the micropayments for streaming, as well as awarding uh, new users tokens and creating their wallets and everything. And uh, we want to get that, you know, up in the hundreds of thousands of millions um, and, and onboard hundreds of thousands of new fans, as well as artists. And because we're we're working with both labeled artists as well as um, independent artists. Uh, we're sort of addressing the long tail, uh, the way YouTube uh, addressed the long tail of, of content creators and video. We really want to bring that uh, to music, um, similar to SoundCloud, but we're actually monetizing the content rather than just giving it away for free. And we want to create a very engaging game uh, that makes it very uh, fun just to listen and discover new music and earn and and help artists and help curate with everything. So um, there's there's definitely um, a lot of opportunity with what we're doing, especially with the crisis, um, because uh, it's very hard now to to monetize online content, and and the music industry is of course ripe for disruption uh, be, with a very old broken business model. And so I think that uh, cryptocurrency, blockchain, and distributed ledger technology really offer uh, the way out of the existing uh, payment gateways and problems uh, with paying artists. And since we can disintermediate and go direct to fan, enable artists to act, interact directly with their fans on a financial basis, um, because music uh, is media, it requires very small payments and the payments to just sort of get out of the way and everything happens seamlessly. So micro payments that happen uh, on a streaming basis, um, for every second of streaming is, is a totally new groundbreaking uh, business model for for stream of content. And, and we believe that that's the way forward. And as well, Matthew Knowles, uh, he said that, you know, streaming and cryptocurrency is the way of the future. And that's why I want to uh, back this project and be behind it. So 
we're of course lucky to have him is and we're also focusing on southeast asia with so adrian foo's probably the has the he's a label artist with universal music hong kong and he has the most streamed album uh in that area and so he's also evangelizing he's sort of a brand ambassador as well for us um in that area and we really want to focus on all areas around the world because music is a global language and therefore we need a global currency uh that's totally secure and able to work for everyone in any uh fiat um that that they need so i appreciate that's excellent i think yeah. so um that's great if you need help with um tackling the music industry in indonesia definitely my family office friends um the uh, second generation that have been successors or looking to always invest and you know you know raise their profile to see how they can you know help enhance the family business um same with latin america and also korea so you know definitely yeah. um i'll share my info later great i appreciate uh, that. thank you so much everybody thank you Ted, for a very profound q a session and um uh, uh, i really congratulate both of the projects because today we had a very heated competition between all the music fans and cryptocurrency fans and uh, with the minor of a change andrew congratulations uh, your tuna fan project uh, is uh, first for today and uh, i just wanted to uh, finalize our today's uh, road show with a quick questions to everybody just a couple of words on how do you find our format uh, fitting your investment strategies or maybe your fundraising campaigns uh, do, do you find it useful and uh, what place exactly uh, in your uh, fundraising or investment effort would it um, take uh, andy could you start um, for myself actually um, I, i really appreciate the opportunity to speak here so a lot of uh, a lot of connections actually happen after the uh, after this uh, web meeting So so far from uh, from from the three uh, event that I've done for uh, LA Token, you know I have uh, possibly gotten about four prospects that uh, I'm thinking of uh, investing. So one of them is a uh, game, and then uh, three others are more into uh, into the field of uh, 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 like blockchain media and um, and and some into payment as well. So I, I think the format is. Uh, is good you know is is good exposure for for both the project and uh, for us as the speaker and investor um but one one thing i i i would love to uh, see is that uh, you know we should have a bit more of uh, you know precise uh, uh discussion you know so that uh, we, among the speakers we we can also try to interact and uh, try to see what kind of synergy we can have uh, b- between all of us because we are all from different parts of the world I'm, i'm in singapore you know some of you are in us so forth and so on i hope to see that kind of synergy as well uh, among the speakers thank you uh thank you so much andy if uh, you allow me now in the in our private chat just let me um uh, just give a note and probably we'll do um common chat for for you in whatsapp for instance with your numbers so that you could have an interaction or follow on uh, as you prefer by email or uh whatsapp for instance um and um uh, andrea um definitely uh, this format of uh, the events organized by le token is very good and very very helpful both for startups for investors and also for the general audience is a very good medium to to spread uh, quality information and positive stuff. And uh, I'm really happy that I believe it's my fifth uh, uh, appearance into this event since the pandemic started. And uh, hopefully I'm able to uh, to add some value and I have to make follow up with a lot of people, both startups and uh, investors. So I will do that. Definitely a very, very good uh, format. Uh, thank you, Adrian and Raul. Thank you, Nadia. I think it's an excellent platform for the investor and for the startups to discuss projects face to face. We can just we can view and uh, uh, see the projects of multiple startups at the same time. It's for the project manager and the startups to discuss their projects with multiple investors and other person at the same time. So from my point of view, it's a very happy to continue. Thank you so much, and Priyanka. 
Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Nadia. Um, and thanks for the session. Obviously, uh, Latukan has uh, organized it and it's been organized pretty well, especially in uh, te these testing times for everyone. Um, uh, my suggestion would be that this was my first, uh, I would say, um, uh, speaking opportunity with Latukan. Uh, I couldn't attend the one in uh, Davos. Uh, but uh, it would be interesting for me to get involved uh, in more uh, growth capital stories or uh, investments in, let's say, a slightly, um, let's say, a Series B kind of uh, companies rather than um, uh, startups or idea stage, because that's where I think most of my strengths uh, and skill sets would be um, uh, used. So, uh, but other than that, I think both the companies were very interesting. And uh, um, I think once they grow to a certain level, once they reach, let's say, um, about 10 million in revenue, then it would get interesting uh, for us um, as investors. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Vikas? Yeah, so thank you, Nadia. I, I think I agree. Uh, you know, this is an excellent format. Uh, firstly, it's very time efficient. Uh, usually, it would take me as much time to just go through one startup, but uh, you can do multiple. You know, so that's very good. Uh, secondly, I think the quality of uh, the companies is very good. So I've attended startup events with twenty companies, and not even one worth you know spending some time. So both the companies there are only two companies, uh, but the quality of both of them is very good. So I think I'm quite impressed with the curation, the guys, the, the work that you're doing. So that's very good. Uh, thirdly, I think I agree with Andy. Uh, if there's an opportunity for the, uh, you know, the speakers to connect, maybe we log in like, you know, half an hour before. So that'll be very good. Uh, it leads to more networking, more common opportunities and some common views on the investments that we see. So that would be quite excellent. So those are the three points uh, broadly from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, um, and Andrew? Yeah, I thought this was a, a great format. This is my first virtual pitch um, of COVID, I, I guess. Um, but it's very cool that it's within the context of an exchange. Of course, we're in the crypto space. And uh, it was very nice to hear everyone's feedback. And I'm definitely um, thinking a lot about what you're saying as in regards to what we're doing. And um, I look forward to following up with all of you in, in one capacity or another. And um, I have lots more information to share, of course, and materials uh, for due diligence as well, um, as well as documents for fundraising for the opening round, uh, the, the round that's now open. And so I look forward to following up with everyone and I appreciate this forum to be able to pitch to all of you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andrew. And Jeffrey, you had experience with us in a previous speech competition, actually won. So, uh, and you are close to uh, finalizing with your fundraising round. So how are you feeling during this um, events of this time? It's a very, very interesting format. Um, I think LA Token was also my very first experience pitching online. So uh, I think generally it is a much more efficient medium than actually having to individually visit each VC's office, um, speak to their associate for an hour, and then the partner may or may not come in, et cetera. So I appreciate this opportunity. I look forward to keeping in touch with all of you. And I definitely see online pitches moving forward to play a larger and larger role in investing. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And Tess? Thank you. Obviously, you guys know I am um, very supportive of what LaToquin is doing. I think Elena and Nadia does a great job along with um, Sunny. Um, I am more than happy when, you know, they all reach out, you know, to uh, ask if I can help speak and share and, you know, meet the other founders and panelists. I'm always happy to do that. Um, so that's why I think the format is excellent. Uh, the, uh, you know, um, pipeline of companies. Um, has definitely um, been 
um, you know, um, um, you know, great companies. And I think the um, ability to attract even um, strong and stronger companies is definitely, I see the evolution and it's, it's really amazing. Um, I've obviously been um, very fortunate to speak uh, from the start of uh, when La, La Token, uh, you know, was in creation. I think I was at the first one um, in San Francisco. So speaking live obviously um, was uh, you know, amazing because you meet everyone. It's a two day event and there's so much to do. Um, so, and so many people to meet and so many great people all gathered together. Uh, and then they, you know, and then LaToken does this globally. So um, in the period when people had more time to focus on blockchain, uh, we would be able to, you know, almost like travel or know that you meet your friends at the tokens event. Now with COVID, they've pivoted quickly, iterated, and been able to, you know, help launch this virtual uh, ability to do show online and get great speakers together and panelists is super impressive. And I, no matter what time, when Nadia or Elena, you know, or Sunny ask me, I always say yes because they tirelessly work back to back. And I'm super impressed with these ladies, um, as well, especially also with um, CEO Valentin. So I think. Um, I think it's an excellent, this just speaks to how many times I help say yes when they ask me to speak. I say yes or moderate. So um, that's enough testament to say how great I think you guys are. Uh, thank you so much, Tess. And thank you everybody um, for participating in our today's roadshow. And we welcome you also to join us later today for keynotes and masterclasses. And we see you soon on Friday for those who will pitch um, for new projects, uh, new segments, and uh, new uh, panelists in the investor panel. And uh, tomorrow we will also have our Startup Leaders Club discussion and Sony's event, uh, as Tess, Tess mentioned, as well from Singapore. And uh, a number of regional events also on Friday uh, from Indonesia. And thank you all and have a nice uh, day and uh, stay safe with all the best. Thank you, everyone.